South Carolina, December 21st, 1938. I was always, from uh, my childhood, uh, I was always interested in the military. Uh, I, I was six or seven near the end of World War II. My brother was in the Navy, enlisted man, and I could see him in his uniform, and I would wear his sailor hat. And my older sister's husband was in the Army, and I would see him in his uniform. So I had a liking for the uniform. My father was never in the military. He had six children and was uh, between World War I and World War II. So my father was never in the military. And then my next older sister's husband uh, took a reserve officer training at Clemson A&M. And, and I was always, uh, uh, always uh, interested in him and his uniform and and I, and I decided, well, I think that's something I like to do. And as a young teenager, I recall during the Korean War, I could hardly wait to get home to read the newspaper about what was going on in Korea during the war. This was in, you know, 1951 to 53. So I was interested in the military even at that point. And uh, it was mandatory when I went to Clemson uh, it's a land grant school, uh, which was mandatory for everyone to take ROTC for two years. And then it was elective to take it for the last two years, which you got paid, and that meant you wanted to become an officer. And you had to stay all four years in order to become an officer. And I wanted to become an officer. I wanted to be a leader. I was commissioned uh, as a second lieutenant field artillery at Clemson A&M, it's now Clemson University. And uh, after a few months, I was sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma for the officer basic training, where you learned all the particulars of, about deploying artillery. And after schooling, I was assigned to a artillery unit in Korea up near the DMZ. And uh, my particular unit there, uh, we operated in the field a lot. My unit was composed 80% of Korean soldiers called Katusas, Korean augmentation to the U.S. Army, Korean soldiers. And uh, I had a Korean counterpart lieutenant uh, that worked with me, and I was a fire and battery executive officer, so I was in charge of four big eight-inch howitzer guns. And uh, my guns were emplaced on targets, emplaced in bunkers with targets over in North Korea. I spent 13 months in Korea, learned a lot about the Army. I, I loved the job I was doing, got a lot of field training. We did a lot of firing on maneuvers and so forth. And I th think that I became a very effective field artillery junior officer. Then I was assigned to Fort Benning, Georgia, and to the 2nd Infantry Division. And I spent a year as the Assistant Operations Officer, the Battalion Fire Direction Officer. And my job was to control the fire direction for the battalion. Uh, a year doing that, and uh, actually I was sent to a Little Creek, Virginia, to Amphibious Warfare School for two weeks uh, because the 2nd Infantry was supposed to be uh, training for amphibious operations. And uh, while I was in training up in Virginia, when I returned back home, uh, I noticed that I had orders reassigning me to the 11th Air Assault 
division, uh, which uh, one week later became the, the first cavalry air mobile division. And a month later, we watched on TV when the President Johnson said, I'm sending the division to Vietnam. So I deployed to Vietnam with the 1st Cavalry Division in, in uh, August of 1965. It took us 30 days by ship. We sailed multiple ships. Uh, my particular ship sailed from Charleston. So we went by, we went by Greyhound buses, all the troops from Fort Benning to Charleston, South Carolina. We boarded the ship sailed through the Gulf of Mexico, down to the Panama Canal, went through the Panama Canal, went up the coast of California to refuel and, and, and get, uh, gain some more supplies and headed off across the Pacific. And 30 days later, we arrived in Vietnam. On the first day we arrived in, in, in Vietnam, we, uh, we docked at Quyn Yon and uh, w went down the ramp with all our weapons. We issued ammunition the, the night before. So we had all our weapons were, uh, we had plenty of ammo, we had all our gear and we were loaded on. We, we walked s several hundred yards to waiting an aircraft and we were flown up to uh, the uh, base camp in 9K. And uh, as we uh, departed uh, the landing zone to go to our in individual, campsite our position it was good it was uh it was turning dark and by the time we arrived uh we started putting up the tents and so forth it was dark and the, uh, that night uh that night uh i believe the next morning we had like vicious rain so it was a miserable first day or two getting adjusted did hear some firing during the night I uh, don't know if there was an enemy or just soldiers being excited and firing off their weapons. Uh, so it took us a few days to get settled into the, to our part of the base camp, which we operated from. And from the base camp, we would go out on maneuvers for two or three days at a time into combat. And we would come back after that operation back to the base camp. And usually, uh, we, we would be in base camp about a couple of weeks or three weeks and we would go out on operation again. My unit was an artillery unit, so when the infantry that we supported went, we went to support it, always within gun range. When the, if the infantry was out on maneuver, uh, say we would be six to seven kilometers from them so we could fire artillery, keep them in range, but not too close like far enough away that we could cover them with artillery. And we would leapfrog and move units as the infantry moved, we would move. So we always would have artillery within range of the, the, of the infantry. We always wanted to have artillery support. And, uh, and, and, and during those times, many times I would be flying as an air observer. I would be talking to the fire direction center and coordinating artillery with the, the ground forces. And I would tell the pilot where to go. The pilot was in charge of the aircraft. I was in charge of the the firing. So I would tell him, you know, we do a, fi a figure eight, fly figure eight, you know, fly like a figure eight, parallel to where the guns are. You don't wanna get in, you always had to be mindful of where the guns are because they can shoot you down too. The pilot would, he would talk to his people he need to, but he would turn over the radio uh, would communicate with the ground forces to me. So we would talk over the intercom to each other. On one of the operations, uh, I, I looked over about 200 yards away, an artillery unit was landing with a Chinook and had a, had a howitzer slung underneath and uh, it was shot down and, uh, and uh, crashed uh, about 200 yards from where I was. Some soldiers ran over to uh, get the uh, troops out and uh, they were able to get all but one out of the, the Chinook before it finally disintegrated. Uh, the, the heat had artillery rounds in it and they were, started cooking off and it just, you know, just was 
a hellacious fire. I served with some well-trained, brave soldiers. Soldiers were mostly, uh, in 1965, the soldiers were were eager to go to go do their part in battle. Good soldiers, so they did they did their job, and uh, we could count on them on every time, uh, on every occasion. Uh, it was only later in the war that things became so bad uh, as the public turned against the war and so forth. And that was not the case in '65 and '66. The soldiers were there; they were proud to do their job, and they did it bravely when with determination we had a lot of a lot of soldiers killed in uh, battle particularly the one in the eye drain because we were outnumbered uh, like three or four to one there was an indication there may be enemy up uh, in the in the valley there near uh, uh, the mountain called chupong mountain the unit went into a landing zone landing zone x-ray on, uh, I believe, uh, November the 14th, about 10 o'clock in the morning, I believe it was the 14th, 1965. And shortly after landing, they captured uh, a soldier, expected maybe that he was a deserter. And they started questioning, say, where, where is your unit? And he's pointed to the mountain. And not knowing how much they were outnumbered, it was like equivalent of of a brigade or maybe two brigades, a brigade of, uh, of enemy North, Viet, uh, North Vietnamese, regular soldiers, not the Viet Cong, but regular soldiers. And shortly after landing, uh, only could get a few troops in a time because the landing zone was small and only about six or so helicopters could land at a time. Uh, then the attack by the enemy started. <laughs> for over t over two days uh, and then again it continued in a day later in a landing zone Albany I was I was landing at an artillery position that was under fire and we didn't know where they were under fire. And as we landed, the, uh, my aircraft was hit and the pilot was hit in the foot and he yelled, everybody out. And I jumped out, you know, and the bullets were flying. Uh, and, but my aircraft was, was hit uh, during the landing at uh, artillery position. It was already, uh, it was under fire and we didn't know it was, they were under fire. It was a machine gunner up on the hillside uh, blasting away and we landed right in it. But the pilot, the co-pilot was able to fly away. As far as I know, uh, they were okay. Since we all went over at the same time, they had to rotate uh, replacements in. So it was a given, it was a, a known fact that within a, about a two week period that you were going. So, I mean, it was, I was expecting, I was out on maneuver, I think just a day before I went back to base camp, got my stuff, and was shuttled over to uh, play coup by helicopter. And in play coup, I got on this uh, C-141 air aircraft and flew to Japan. And from Japan, we were we flew on charter aircraft back to the United States. And uh, that's what I, I remember is I was getting on the airplane, incoming troops were coming and we said, you know, 
Wish you luck. All the best. If you're swapping, they're coming off, going, coming into Vietnam, and you're leaving. It's quite a good feeling. A year after I was back, a former commander of mine wanted me uh, to go back to Vietnam to be his operation officer. I was a captain at the time, and that job is a, a, a major's job. And it'd be a good job, but at that time, I had met my wife, uh, was still a girlfriend then, I was not married, and I said, no, I don't think I want to do that. Uh, so uh, I went to, uh, I got married, and we went to Germany for two years, two and a half years. And I was on orders to go back to Vietnam from Germany. And when I arrived back in the States, my orders were re uh, my, my orders were changed to reassign me to the States. At that point, it was 1972 and the war was winding down. And so I was reassigned to uh, ROTC detachment at Furman University and to be assistant professor of military science. So I was on orders for a second time, but it didn't go. <laughs>